Hi, my name is Chris Gibbons. I'm the director for the Healthcare Administration Program, and welcome to the program. You're obviously working through the new student checklist that was in your packet because, well, the number one item was to watch this welcome video. Now, I know that when all of us start something new, whether it's a new job or, or a new educational endeavor, there can be some nervousness and some apprehension about what's next and a lot of questions. So in this video, I hope to answer many of the questions that you have and that you'll be fully confident to start the program in the next few weeks. I'd like to break down my presentation into a couple different areas. The first one will be uh, addressing some frequently asked questions. And in the second part, I wanna walk through that new student checklist and kind of tell you about those next steps as you get ready for the program. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about some frequently asked questions that students usually have before they start the program. And they're kind of uh, in a couple of different areas. The first one is generally centered around technical requirements. Do I need a fancy computer? Can I take classes on my phone or my iPad or my mobile device? So let's talk about that. The first thing that you're absolutely going to need for this program is a computer. Whether that's a laptop or a desktop, doesn't make a difference, but you definitely need a computer to do the program. And my recommendation is that computer is probably relatively newer, maybe not any older than five years. Now, what we have noticed, why I picked that five year mark, is what we've noticed is that students who have a little bit older devices, five, six, seven years old, tend to have issues. So take a look at your laptop. Maybe it's booting up and it's not booting up the way it should and it crashes from time to time or just sporadically shuts off. And maybe it is about five or six years old. The last thing you want to have happen as you're going through your coursework is to have your, your computer crash on you and just die. It can be very, very stressful, especially if you have a lot of information on that hard drive and that hard drive seizes up and you can't get that information out of that hard drive. So take a look at your laptop, your computer, and make sure that it is, uh, it's working, it's doing well. Maybe it's, if it is five years old, but working like a champ, then you're probably gonna be okay. But if it is starting to, to show some signs of age, you may wanna consider getting a new laptop. Now, what kind of laptop can you use or computer? Uh, does it have to be Mac or can it be Windows-based PC? Uh, it can be both. Um, there's no problem with either uh, Mac or PC. Those will both work just fine for your digital campus and completing your work here at Mercy College. Uh, but again, the biggest thing that we see is that the age of it and making sure that it is nice, uh, that it is working and it's not giving you any, any issues. So the uh, last thing you wanna do is to lose all of your very hard work. Some other, I guess, hardware requirements that you'll need for the program. Uh, questions like, do I need a camera? Well, most laptops, uh, almost every, every laptop today has a camera built into it. If for some reason you have a desktop and you do not have a webcam, at some point you will need to get a webcam. Um, you will be asked at points uh, to do presentations, kind of like this, little video presentations of, of coursework in various courses. Not every course, but you will need a webcam. Again, most students, 99% of the students have that already incorporated in their laptop and it's not an issue. Many students often buy a microphone kind of like this um, because the microphone in laptops uh, tends not to be so good. The cameras used to be are usually okay, but the sound is pretty horrible in most laptops. So many students will get a, a separate microphone similar to this uh, just to be able so we can hear them better for their presentations. Now, you don't need to run out and buy that now. Uh, you can buy the microphone if you wish down the road when you get your first assignment where you're gonna be doing a presentation. So you can do that uh, again uh, when that event actually occurs. And these microphones run about 10 to $15. So they're not that expensive. Webcams, if you do need to get one, of course you can spend up to 100 or more on a very fancy webcam you can get a real nice webcam for about 20 bucks. So again, something to be aware of down the road that you'll probably will need those items if you don't already have them built into your laptop. So those are kind of the hardware requirements. You need a good serviceable laptop that's gonna be dependable for you. And even that's not a guarantee something's gonna happen. You wanna make sure that you have a built-in webcam or a webcam available at some point and you might get a microphone. Now let's talk a little bit about software, kind of a, an area between software and hardware, which I call backup. 
So I talked about the, the fact that a, a laptop can have a catastrophic failure and completely seize up, and you lose all the information on that. Well, as you all know, they say, well, it's in order to avoid that, that you back up often and frequently. I highly, highly recommend that you get into this habit of backing up your material. Now, there's a lot of ways to back up uh, your hard work. Um, some of them are off-site backups, which I use personally. You can also use uh, cloud services, cloud drives, where everything is kept uh, in a cloud drive which is off-site. So if your laptop gets stolen or in a fire or blows up or whatever, all of your information is in a drive in kind of the cloud. OneDrive is a very popular product. Um, there are many out there that do that where you can keep your information. Plus, it's accessible on multiple devices. So if you're writing a paper and you're doing it at home, and then you decide to go to the library and work on your paper and use one of the library computers and you're able to access that drive, you can simply uh, you know, connect to that and get that information and work on it from any device. I know with for OneDrive, for instance, which I use, I could access it on any mobile device, any computer, anywhere. Makes it really handy in doing your work uh, without necessarily carrying a, de a specific device around with you. And I know peace of mind, if that something should happen, I'm okay, that information is saved up in the cloud. So look at, uh, look at some backup options. Um, even the most simplest backup options of putting things on a flash drive is better than none. The problem with that is that you have to remember to save it. You gotta remember to take your little flash drive, put it in the laptop and move the material over and copy it. And even if you're really fastidious on doing it, maybe you do it only once a week, if something were to happen, you've lost that week's activities. So uh, that can be a, a really devastating for you. So I highly recommend you look at some some of the services out there, such as a cloud drive service. There are a ton of them. There's even some backup services that happen uh, in the background uh, with your material. I use one called, I use, I have three different backups going on simultaneously on my laptop. And one of them that I use is called Carbonite. Um, there are a ton out there, but anything that I write and put on my laptop, uh, papers, um, even images, automatically gets saved to my Carbonite account. I don't have to do anything about it. Usually within about 15 seconds after I've, I've written something, it's already saved that version up to the cloud. That's really nice as well. So take a look at that. Come up with something that works for you. You may already have something that you use, um, but it is uh, definitely recommended that you have some sort of off-site backup, not something in your house. If again, something were to happen, maybe uh, we've had this happen a couple semesters, a student lost, stolen uh, their laptop and their book bag, and they had their flash drive and the laptop in the book bag. They smashed the car window, took everything. Everything was gone. Now that's devastating enough, plus all the work that they were doing even made it more devastating. If you know they were lucky enough or had they had that off-site backup, at least that would have reduced some of that stressful incident. So keep that in mind to have some form of backup as you go through the program. All right, well, let's talk about pure software now. So do you need any special software for the program? No, not necessarily. You'll be able to access your digital canvas, uh, your digital campus through any web browser. And the digital campus that we use is called Canvas. There are many different types out there. About three of them are used across the country. Canvas is one of the biggest ones. And I think you'll really like it. It's easy, it's nav very easy to navigate. Students like the interface. But you'll simply access that through your web browser. So no, uh, no special software there. Now, one of the things you will need to have is it's not necessarily a specific software, but it's a, a specific format. And when you are writing a document, you're writing a paper, you'll be doing a few papers here uh, at, as you go through the program. And as you're writing a paper, you will be saving that. Now, how do you write a document? Well, there's a couple, basically a couple different ways right now in today's modern society. One is Pages. Pages is through uh, Apple. And then there's Microsoft Word, which pretty much dominates everything. Uh, Pages is pretty much in some small academic areas, but Word is used all throughout business 
and in many colleges. So Microsoft Word is really our default, uh, our default way that we have students submit papers. It has to be in a Microsoft Office Word format. Now, does that mean you have to go out and get Microsoft Office to do that? No, you don't. You can actually use Pages. You can use some free uh, you know, productivity software such as uh, Google. But you have to remember to save your material in that Microsoft Office format. In general, what I recommend for students is to go ahead and have Office. Again, there's work aware, there's workarounds. Um, if you already have um, have that software, such as Pages, you can work around that. But I would recommend that you do look at maybe getting Office. It makes your life a little bit easier because Microsoft Office will include Word and PowerPoint and Excel and a lot of other really nifty little programs that you can use uh, throughout your time here. And as a student, Microsoft Office uh, offers a wonderful student discount. There's something called Office 365 University Edition. So you want to make sure you Google that, Office 365 University Edition student discount. You can get it directly from uh, Microsoft last that I checked uh, a couple of semesters ago. And for about, at that point, it was around $60. You could get a four-year subscription to that product. And that product would normally cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars uh, to get that, all of those programs at once. So it's a heck of a deal. Even at 60 bucks, I know that can be kind of expensive, but it will cover you pretty much throughout your entire time here. Um, so you'll have that. Now, I do know $60 is kind of steep. Again, there are some workarounds that may cost you or cost you nothing, such as uh, Google Docs. Um, you know, it is a nice, basically kind of, kind of a clone or a copy of Microsoft Office where you can do Excel, you know, type worksheets, you can do PowerPoint or presentations, and you can do um, written documents. And you can save them all into compatible formats into that Word, Excel, and PowerPoint format. Now, why, is, why are we so obsessed about format? Well, your instructors only have a certain set of software on their computers, which means that they can only view Microsoft Office documents. If you send them a pages document, we do not have Macs here. So we don't provide them pages or access to that. And it is very difficult um, for them to open a pages document. So we are kind of a Microsoft Office school when we look at uh, the file format to which we can grade your assignments. So please, uh, please keep, uh, keep that in mind. So there's uh, there are some of the software and hardware requirements for the program. Uh, now, next, I would like to talk a little bit about the student checklist that you have. Again, this first item was this welcome video. So if you have a moment, uh, pull out your checklist and we'll kind of run through the next steps that you'll be taking for uh, for the program and getting ready. So the first one, obviously, was to watch the welcome video, which you did. So a good job there. And now we're going to be going on to uh, step two. And I do want you to follow these in sequence, if at all possible. Uh, we've designed it to be somewhat sequential. Now, you can skip if necessary, but uh, do try to follow. Just don't jump ahead to from, from one to ten or one to nine. Try to follow the steps through. You may start a step and then uh, be continuing to work on one and then skip ahead. That you can do, but keep to the spirit uh, to keep these uh, somewhat sequential as you go through it. So the next step is to set up your Empower Me account. Now, many of you may have already done this as you've gone through the admissions process. But if you haven't, please take time at step two to go ahead and set up your Empower Me account. Now, Empower Me is the name of our, of our portal, of our software, where you're going to be able to register for your uh, courses, which is very important. You'll do that every semester and also how you see your final grades. You'll be able to look at your final grades uh, for the semester in Empower Me. It's not a system you use frequently. You typically only use it a couple of times a semester, once to register for courses and wants to see your final grades, and that's about it. But it is important that you do get uh, set up with the Empower Me account. All the instructions are listed there to do that. Let's move up to step three, enrollment and uh, your enrollment deposit. If you haven't done so, make sure you have your enrollment deposit in. That's going to solidify and ensure that you have your seat in the program. Now, most of you, by the time that you've reached this point in the checklist, you've already done that. But if you, if you haven't, make sure that you do get that enrollment deposit in. 
there's a link in there for you to do that enrollment deposit. And remember, it is a deposit against your tuition, so it's not a fee. Uh, it's actually taken off of your tuition bill. That money's applied right back to your tuition. The next step is very important. Number four, set up and establish your college Mercy, uh, your Mercy College email. Uh, your email will be an, assen an essential way that will communicate uh, to you as your, your time here at Mercy College. So it's something you definitely want to have set up. So go through the steps there. Make sure that you have your email all set up. And if you have a moment after you set up your email, please send me an email. Let me know that it's working for you just to give it a little test. Uh, that can be a great, uh, great way. So I have on there, test your college email by sending me an email. You don't have to say anything. Just say hello is fine. Uh, again, we'll make sure that email is, is working for you. I'm receiving it and I'll reply back to you. Number five, well, the reason you're all here is to register for your courses. Now, in your new student packet, you received two plans of study. You received a full and part-time plan of study. I always like to include both to have you so you can compare and contrast on what you want to do. So pick out your full or part-time, whichever route you want to go. In most cases, I recommend students start part-time, get used to things, and then after you're used to the flow of being back in school, then you can always ramp it up to full time. But that's really up to you. Occasionally, we do have some students who are ready to start full time and they do just uh, just fine. But really, the choice is yours. So pick the, uh, the pick the plan that you wish to do, either full or part time, and then you'll register for those courses through that Empower Me system that I talked about a few moments ago. And in this uh, little checklist on number five, it'll guide you through on how to register for your courses. The next thing you'll want to do is make sure that you have your financial aid or tuition reimbursement all set up. This is step six. Again, many of you have already done this, so that's okay. But if you haven't done that, you'll want to do it now. Our financial aid department can work with you very uh, very quickly but it does take a little bit of time so it's something you really don't want to wait a day or two before the semester starts you do want to get that going that is if you feel that you're going to need uh, financial aid tuition reimbursement that's something that may be coming from your employer now not every employer offers tuition reimbursement but if you're lucky enough to work for an employer that does you definitely want to check with them and find out what their policies are for tuition reimbursement. Every uh, employer is a little bit different, but they the one thing that's the same about all of them when I talk to students is they have a process and you must follow their process in order to get your tuition reimbursement. It may be filling out a little bit of paperwork, maybe having your boss approve the degree that you're taking. We've never had any issues with anybody taking the healthcare administration uh, program because employers love that degree. They love their employees to get that degree. It makes them more valuable to the organization. So, uh, but, but do make sure you check with your HR and you follow whatever policies they want uh, that you need to ensure that you have a smooth um, process with getting tuition reimbursement if, again, a, your employer offers it. So you got that. Again, financial aid uh, or tuition reimbursement. Oh, and before I leave this step, let me talk a little bit more about financial aid. There's something called a FAFSA, this uh, F-A-F-S-A. You might be familiar with that. You might not be. It all depends on how long you've been out of school. So it's uh, something, though, if you've been to school in the past maybe 10 to 15 years, you've probably heard of the FAFSA. I highly recommend that you fill this out. It's um, kind of like an application. And what it does is it, it's a federal form that pre-qualifies you for various federal and financial aid packages. It doesn't obligate you to accept those packages, but it does tell you what you can or may qualify for. And that can be very, very helpful. I love telling this story. Uh, a few years ago, I had a student and she was like, yeah, I don't need to fill it out. I make way too much money. She told me how much she made. She made quite a bit of money. Uh, she made a very good salary. But um, and you would think on the face of that that she wouldn't have qualified for anything. Well, because she had so many, uh, and I said, you know, give it a shot. You know, it doesn't hurt. You know, so she went ahead and applied. Even if she needed, let's say, student loans down the road, she would have had that all squared away. 
uh, because the student loan rate is very favorable. And um, so it made sense that she may need that at some point, even though she was anticipating maybe paying out of pocket. She wasn't quite sure. But it was still a little bit tight. So she, But she decided to fill out the FAFSA and say, all right, well, let's see what happens. Well, because she was a single parent and she had some other qualifying factors, number of dependents, number of dependents in school, I think she had four, maybe uh, five children at the time, all school age. Um, she was able to qualify actually for a grant, which is uh, kind of free money, money that didn't need to be paid back. So again, because because of her qualifying factors, she was able to get that. So I guess you ever you never know what the FAFSA may reveal. So please fill that out. I highly recommend that you fill that out. Again, it doesn't obligate you to anything. Uh, it's kind of more of a pre-qualifying should you need it. So there you go on the FAFSA and the financial aid process. If you decide to, if you are going for financial aid, you have to fill out the FAFSA anyway. Um, so it's a kind of a, a good step. I, I recommend that you take. All right, so that's number six. We'll move on from that. Number seven, schedule your academic advising appointment. So you want to follow the steps there to schedule that appointment with your academic advisor. That academic advisor is going to be critical to your success here at Mercy College. There's really, um, you know, two folks that are uh, the most important probably to you as you as you go through uh, your time here. And by far, the academic advisor is going to be the number one. It's not the program director like myself. I'm usually number two uh, when, it, when it comes into that. But the academic advisor, uh, she's going to be with you, helping you with your courses, helping you um, kind of navigate uh, that curriculum as you go through it. So definitely um, schedule that academic advising appointment. It's more of a nice way to establish that relationship with your advisor. You might have some questions about your plan of study. Again, you've picked either a full or part time. You might have some questions about that. Uh, she can answer those, but it's really to set that foundation for that relationship that you're going to be having with your success team uh, all the way through to, to graduation. So uh, do schedule that and again, allow 10 to 30 minutes for that appointment, which happens all over the phone. All right, so that's number seven, your academic advisor. Number eight, uh, complete Mercy College and program orientation. So there's a couple of different orientations that you'll be having. One is for the college getting familiar with the general college, the services that are there for you, the support services especially, you want to pay attention to that. So that's kind of the big picture. Then you have an orientation, smaller picture, that'll be focused on the healthcare administration program only. Now, to do both of these orientations, which are self-paced, it could take about five to six hours. So what I recommend is that you break it up over a period of time, maybe plan, you know, three or four days, just do about an hour a piece until they're all done. It's also a good way for it to kind of, that information to kind of sink in. Now you'll always will have access to these links. So if down the road you wanted to watch the tutorial on how to use various student services here, you could go back to that at a future date. So those are available to you at any point, even after you start the program as a refresher if you need it. So do uh, do do that. But um, again, I wouldn't sit down and, and do the whole thing all at once. It can get a little monotonous, uh, though many students do. They just get it knocked out in about four to six hours. But I think it's best to, to break it up into a couple different sessions. OK, then number nine, you're going to complete various Canvas tasks. So Canvas is your, uh, your, your digital campus. That's where you're going to be attending your course. So within that, we've sort of snuck in a third orientation, and that's one specific to the digital campus that you'll be taking. Where do I click? How do I access a course? How do I do a discussion? How do I submit an assignment? These are all things that we want to get knocked out for you before you start your first day of class. We don't have you, we don't want you to be worrying about various technical issues on the first day of class. We just want you to be able to worry about the course, the learning in those courses. Maybe you have a problem with watching video. The video isn't working. You know, we can work, get these, get these uh, kinks all worked out before the first day so you don't have any issues when you're actually worried about ac the learning portion uh, of the program. So you'll be going through the complete Canvas uh, orientation in section nine. That again will run probably uh, maybe a couple of hours uh, to get all of that done. 
Then your last step will be to order your textbooks. Now you'll know what classes you're taking because you picked one of your plans of study and you'll be able to look up at our bookstore which books are required uh, for those books for those courses and you'll be able to order your textbooks. It's very important that you have your textbooks by the first day of your class for the classes that are running in that first eight week period. If you remember as you were learning more about the program is that the program uh, the courses are eight weeks long and they're, we've divided a semester into two parts. So in the first eight weeks, you may have one or two courses, depending whether you're full or part time. And in the second eight weeks, you'll have, again, one or two courses. You don't necessarily have to order all of your books all at once, but you definitely want to have the courses that are coming up for you in that first eight weeks in your hands by that first date. Our courses go very, very fast or only eight weeks long. So having that textbook uh, is really critical because we there's not a lot of um, we hit the ground running, if you will, in the courses and and reading assignments will be there in that very first week. Now, we know issues can happen, um, you know, with with textbooks, maybe the bookstore was out or something happened. Definitely work with your instructors if that should ever happen. Uh, work with your instructors. Let them know that you do not have the textbooks. Usually, we can provide the readings for the first week uh, for you um, without being any kind of trouble with the publisher, but anything beyond that becomes a real issue in us providing you copies of the readings. Uh, you know, they get a little, a little uh, touchy about copyright law. The first week is usually fine uh, as students kind of, if they did have an issue. Now, in the, you'll notice in that checklist, we refer to the college's bookstore. Do you have to order textbooks from the bookstore? No, you don't. You can order them from any source that you like. Um, our bookstore is very good as far as uh, customer service. They can tend to be a little pricey. So it's really uh, up to you, you know, be a savvy shopper, uh, you know, whether it's Amazon or Half.com, uh, Barnes & Noble. The only thing I caution you is buyer beware. Uh, we occasionally have students who try to order textbooks through eBay or some other sources and they never get their books or they get them six weeks late and the course is already over. So do stick to a rep reputable bookseller. I personally like Amazon. I know I can have it in a day or two at a fair price um, and, you know, great tracking and accountability mechanisms with Amazon. So um, I guess buyer beware if you're doing something other than the college bookstore. So keep that in mind. But you can save a few bucks uh, if uh, if you're a savvy shopper. Now, for those of you that are maybe on financial aid and your financial aid package also encompasses textbooks, it is easier to order from the college's bookstore because there's a voucher system that goes right to the bookstore and you don't have to worry about kind of moving money around. So keep that in mind for those of you that are doing financial aid and wrapping everything all together. Um, you know, you're kind of, uh, it makes it a little bit easier for you to use the college bookstore. All right, that concludes. We've gone through uh, the frequently asked questions. We talked a little bit about hardware, software, um, you know, kind of requirements, backup. You know, make sure you back up all of your work. Find out some backup systems that you like. Make sure you have a nice, decent working laptop, uh, you know, as you enter the program. And then we walked through this new student checklist. Again, this is really critical. Just make sure that you're following all the steps here, all steps one through 10, uh, as you get ready to start the program and you'll be ready to go by the first day of class. Now, if you have any questions as you're going through there, you have my card. Please feel free to give me a call or email me. You'll also be working with your academic advisor. Uh, she'll be able to help you as well as you get ready to start the program. All right, with that, that concludes our presentation. And thank you so much for choosing the Healthcare Administration Program. We're really excited about you starting in the next semester. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck. And never hesitate to reach out to me as you're going through the program. All right, thanks.